Good morning, everybody. Here's a fun fact I didn't even think about until a little while ago when I sat down in the pew. Today is December 27th. 22 years ago today, I preached the first sermon I ever preached out here at Payne Brown. <laughs> Bet you didn't know that. <coughs> we didn't have a sound system back then. We rolled that little thing out there because there were very few people here shortly after Christmas. Anyway, that was just one of those fun and interesting things. Kind of goes along with our class discussion this morning about things you remember and commemorate. Anyway, this is the last Sunday of 2020, a year that a lot of folks will be glad to put in the rearview mirror. This is the last time we come together as a congregation, and it's interesting, because as the year rolls over, we tend to compartmentalize and say, this is last year, and now we move on to next year. And you know what? That's actually a pretty good thing. Back in the 1930s, a guy named J.R.R. Tolkien wrote a book called The Hobbit. And early on in that book, there's a scene where one of the heroes of the story, he's a wizard named Gandalf, he's the one leading them all, he disappears. And so the rest of the crew goes off and they get themselves in trouble. And at the last minute, Gandalf shows back up and saves the day. And the guy in charge of the rest of them turns and says, Gandalf, where did you wander off to? Why were you gone? And he says, I was looking ahead. They said, well, what brought you back? And he says, looking behind. <laughs> That's actually quite a scriptural concept. We need to be looking forward and looking at the things that we're going to be doing tomorrow and the next day, and the next day, and the way we're going to live our lives as Christians today, tomorrow, and the rest of our lives, while also looking back to remember how we got here, and the things that we need to change, and the things we need to do a little differently. So as I was preparing for this sermon, I started looking through Scripture, and I started going over in my head, can I find some support for this? Well, we're not going to read everywhere where there's support for this because there's a lot of it. In a few weeks, actually probably a couple of months at this rate, Corey will get around to the end of the book of Genesis. And in Genesis chapter 48 through Genesis chapter 50, you have a couple of things happen. We're not going to read those today. He'll get to them eventually. I'm going to give you the brief recap. Jacob dies. I know, it's a spoiler. I should have told you the spoiler alert. Jacob dies, and before he dies, he looks back a little on his life. And he looks forward a little on what's going to happen in the future. And then, in chapter 50, Joseph dies. And, once again, he looks back on his life and he talks about the future of his people. Even hundreds of years into the future. Makes, leaves instructions that are going to be carried out over 400 years into the future. You fast forward a couple books and you get to the end of Deuteronomy. Now, basically, the entirety of Deuteronomy is Moses looking back. It's the second speaking of the law. Because Moses, at the end of the wilderness wandering, at the, at the end of the people of Israel, they're finally getting ready to go into the promised land. Moses recaps everything. He says, guys, I'm going to remind you of everything. I'm going to talk to you about all the things that have happened to us so far. All the commandments God has given us. I'm going to remind you about the things that... God has told us the things that we've seen and done and experienced. I want to remind you of these things from our past. But I'm also going to tell you what God says about our future. And so then he spends the last couple chapters talking about when you get into the land that you aren't even in yet, this is how you behave and this is what you do. We are going to turn and look at Joshua chapter 24. We're going to read Joshua chapter 24 because this is a key chapter in my mind. So Deuteronomy has been fulfilled, mostly. The, the things that Moses said, you're going to go into the land, you're going to conquer these people, you're going to do all this. Joshua was the one that led them to conquer Canaan. But then Joshua, at the end of his life, is looking back and reflecting. And so in Joshua 24, he says... It says, Then Joshua gathered all the tribes of Israel to Shechem, 
and called for the elders of Israel and for the heads and their judges and their officers, and they presented themselves before God. Joshua said to all the people, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, From ancient times your fathers lived beyond the river, namely Terah, the father of Abraham, and the father of Nahor, and they served other gods. Then I took your father Abraham from beyond the river, led him through all the land of Canaan, and multiplied his descendants, and gave him Isaac. To Isaac I gave Jacob and Esau, and to Esau I gave him out Seir to possess it, but Jacob and his sons went down to Egypt. Then I sent Moses and Aaron, and I plagued Egypt by what I did in its midst, and afterward I brought you out. I brought your fathers out of Egypt, and you came to the sea, and Egypt pursued your fathers with chariots and horsemen to the Red Sea. But when they cried out to the Lord, he put darkness between you and the Egyptians, and brought the sea upon them and covered them, and your own eyes saw what I did in Egypt. And you lived in the wilderness for a long time. Then I brought you into the land of the Amorites, who lived beyond the Jordan, and they fought with you. And I gave them into your hand, and you took possession of their land when I destroyed them before you. Then Balak, the son of Zippor, king of Moab, arose and fought against Israel. And he sent and summoned Balaam, the son of Beor, to curse you. But I was not willing to listen to Balaam, so he had to bless you, and I delivered you from his hand. You crossed the Jordan and came to Jericho. And the citizens of Jericho fought against you, the Amorite, the Perizzite, and the Canaanite, and the Hittite, and the Girgashite, the Hivite, and the Jebusite. Thus I gave them into your hand. Then I sent the hornet before you, and it drove out the two kings of the Amorites from before you, but not by your sword or your bow. I gave you a land on which you had not labored, and cities which you had not built, and you have lived in them, your eating of vineyards and olive groves, which you did not plant. I'm going to pause there, because the first 13 verses of this chapter, what is God doing? He's looking back. God is looking back. He's having the people of Israel stop and look at everything in the past because he's about to remind them of what they need to do in the future. So he has spent the first 13 verses saying, I'm going to go all the way back to Abraham. Your great, 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 Abraham and Isaac and Jacob all the way back there so I can remind you of how long my vision is. And how I have set things in motion to get us to where we are today. And the last verse there is, and so today you are living here in a land that you didn't really conquer yourself. I conquered for you. Dwelling in houses that you didn't build yourself. Eating from the produce of vineyards that you didn't plant yourself. All of these are blessings from God. Now, were the Israelites... Still sometimes a little unhappy? Yeah. Did the Israelites, even at this point, still slack off somewhat? Yeah. If they had done everything they were supposed to do, would all the problems of the book of Judges, which comes next, have come to fruition? No. I mean, there's an entire tribe. Dan, in the book of Judges, they didn't bother driving the people out of their land. And so instead, in the book of Judges, they give up and say, we're going to go elsewhere. We don't, you know, we know the land God gave us was good, but it was kind of hard to conquer that land. We're just going to go elsewhere. In fact, we're going to grab and make our own God on the way because we know that the real God wanted us to be here. They didn't listen to this, did they? Well, if they listened, they didn't hear. And so not looking back and recognizing what God has done for them already they complain. Remember when they first came out of Egypt? Anybody remember what they did? They got across the Red Sea. They said, oh, we're going to starve to death in the wilderness. We don't have any food. We had garlic. I like garlic, but that's not one of the first things you want to come out of my mouth. We had garlic back then. And melons and leeks. And... Isn't that what they say? I may be misquoting, but I don't think I am. We had melons and garlic. And here we don't have anything except our freedom and our lives. We don't appreciate those. We want melons and garlic instead of freedom in our life. And so I think that's why God, through Joshua, goes all the way back to Abraham to show them and remind them of everything that's happened and all the blessings. And he says, and today you're not even having time for this stuff. And they still look at it and say, mm, it's not good enough. It's too hard. We ever run into people like that today? You ever run into people who don't appreciate all the things they need to do? 
I'm going to tell you this. I always have to throw in a soccer coaching thing. And this is kind of appropriate because when I'm coaching soccer, sometimes there are parents who go, well, you guys aren't winning. Well, I don't coach to win. I'm kind of strange that way. I don't coach to win. I coach to develop players. I coach to help the players have fun. I coach to help them enjoy their experience, get some exercise, stay safe, learn and grow. I don't coach to win. But what I do with my players, every single game we have ever played, is we chat at halftime and I ask them things. Ask them what we're doing wrong. Ask them what we're doing right. Ask them if there's anything we need to change going forward. And I have never had a team, okay, I've had one team. This is a completely different story. I had one team, one time, that did worse in the second half than in the first half. That team did worse in the second half because they had no substitutes. They were playing shorthanded, actually, and they were exhausted in the 90-degree heat. And the team we were playing against had, like, seven substitutes. So try as hard as we could in the second half, we didn't do it as well. But every other team that I have ever coached, we talk at halftime, we say, what have we done right? What have we done wrong? And what do we need to do now? And every single one of those teams that you sit there and have that conversation, if they take it to heart, and they usually do, does better in the second half. So what Joshua is doing here is he's giving his halftime speech to the people of Israel. And he says, here's what God has done for us. We haven't even had to do it ourselves. Here's what God has done for us in the first half. He says, now it's the second half. It's your turn. What are we going to do? So we pick back up in verse 14. Now therefore, fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and truth. And put away the gods which your fathers served beyond the river and in Egypt. And serve the Lord. If it is disagreeable in your sight to serve the Lord, choose for yourselves today whom you will serve, whether the gods which your fathers served, which were beyond the river, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. The people answered and said, Far be it from us that we should forsake the Lord to serve other gods. For the Lord our God is he who brought us and our fathers up out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage, and who did these great things great signs in our sight and preserved us through all the way in which we went and among all the peoples through whose midst we passed. The Lord drove out from before us all the people, even the Amorites who lived in the land. We also will serve the Lord, for he is our God. Then Joshua said to the people, You will not be able to serve the Lord, for he is a holy God. He is a jealous God. He will not forgive your transgression or your sins. If you forsake the Lord and serve foreign gods, then he will turn and do you harm and consume you after he has done good to you. The people said to Joshua, No, but we will serve the Lord. Joshua said to the people, You are witnesses against yourselves that you have chosen for yourselves the Lord to serve him. And they said, We are witnesses. Now therefore, put away the foreign gods which are in your midst and incline your hearts to the Lord, the God of Israel. The people said to Joshua, We will serve the Lord our God and we will obey his voice. So Joshua made a covenant with the people that day and made for them a statute and an ordinance in Shechem. And Joshua wrote these words in the book of the law of God, and he took a large stone and set it up there under the oak that was by the sanctuary of the Lord. Joshua said to all the people, Behold, this stone shall be for a witness against us, for it has heard all the words of the Lord which he spoke to us. Thus it shall be for a witness against you, so that you do not deny your God. Then Joshua dismissed the people, each to his inheritance. It came about after these things that Joshua, the son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died, being 110 years old. And they buried him in the territory of his inheritance in Timnath Sirah, which is in the hill country of Ephraim, on the north of Mount Gash. Israel served the Lord all the days of Joshua and all the days of the elders who survived Joshua and had known all the deeds of the Lord which he had done for Israel. Now they buried the bones of Joseph, which the sons of Israel brought up from Egypt at Shechem, in the piece of ground which Jacob had bought from the sons of Hamor, the father of Shechem, for 100 pieces of money, and they became the inheritance of Joseph's sons. And Eleazar, the son of Aaron, died, and they buried him at Gibeah of Phinehas, his son, which was given him in the hill country of Ephraim. Now that's kind of interesting because that kind of ties us back to what we said in Genesis 50. Remember I told you that there would be a, a prediction that he gave that would be 400 plus years in the future and instructions? That was it. Joseph said, 
when you guys leave here, take my bones and bury them. And they did. What happens here is interesting. Because Joshua recounts the past. And he focuses them on the future. And what does it say about the people of Israel during Joshua's entire lifetime? As long as he lived, they were faithful. Not only that, but as long as the elders who outlasted him lived, they were faithful. These are the men he's talking to that day and says, you need to choose today. I'm going to remind you of what God has done. You make a choice for yourself. Sometimes we forget that. Sometimes in our religion, we tend to focus on easy paths. We tend to focus on ourselves and keeping people quiet instead of bringing people up and making them know and learn about God. If we have an entire generation of children that sit there in our Bible classes and sing Sunday school songs and never learn about what God has done for us, really learn and understand, which a lot of places do, and just kind of toss them in the back and keep them quiet. We're not raising up a generation like Joshua raised up here. If we are not teaching the next generation, which I want to say this, it looks like the elders, while they learned the lesson from Joshua, I don't know what happened, but they didn't pass on that lesson directly to their children and to their grandchildren and great-grandchildren. Because the people of Israel after these elders are nothing like this. You look at the book of Judges, the next book over, nothing like this. That's also the story of the kingdom period. We're going to look at one brief thing in the kingdom period. Go ahead and turn to 1 Kings chapter 2. Overall, I'm going to tell you during the kingdom period, it is hard to find good kings. Kings of the north, kings of the south, it's hard to find good kings. Now, here's the thing. 1 Kings chapter 2, we have a transition from David, the second king, to his son Solomon, the third king. Right? I find it interesting that during this transition, David apparently told Solomon, hey, I want you to build the temple. God wants you to build the temple. I've gotten all the supplies for you, etc. But then his last wishes are a little more, I don't know, mundane, in my opinion. So in 1 Kings chapter 2, David's going to look back and look forward a little bit with Solomon. As David's time to die drew near, he charged Solomon, his son, saying, I'm going the way of all the earth. Be strong, therefore, and show yourself a man. Keep the charge of the Lord your God to walk in his ways, to keep his statutes, his commandments, his ordinances, and his testimonies according to what is written in the law of Moses, that you may succeed in all that you do and wherever you turn. So that the Lord may carry out his promise which he spoke concerning me, saying, If your sons are careful of their way to walk before me in truth with all their heart and with all their soul, you shall not lack a man on the throne of Israel. So that's a good introduction. That's a good beginning. He says, Solomon... Go forward. He says, you need to focus on God. But did he really focus on what God had done for him? No, he just says, Solomon, you be good and God will bless you. That's how I take that. I find it interesting what he does focus on from the past. So we'll continue on in verse 5. Now you know what Joab the son of Zariah did to me, what he did to the two commanders of the armies of Israel, to Abner the son of Ner, and to Amasa the son of Jether, whom he killed. He also shed the blood of war in peace, and he put the blood of war on his belt about his waist and on his sandals on his feet. So act according to your wisdom, and do not let his gray hair go down to Sheol in peace. But show kindness to the sons of Barzillai the Gileadite. Let them be among those who eat at your table. For they assisted me when I fled from Absalom your brother. Behold, there is with you Shimei, the son of Gera, the Benjamite, of Bahurim. Now it was he who cursed me with a violent curse on the day I went to Mahanaim. But when he came down to me at the Jordan, I swore to him by the Lord, saying, I will not put you to death with the sword. Now therefore do not let him go unpunished, for you are a wise man, and you will know what you ought to do with him. And you will bring his gray hair down to Sheol with blood. 
And David slept with his fathers and was buried in the city of David. I want you to think about that. We just talked about how important it is to focus on what God has done for us. As a way to understand what we need to do going forward. We read in Joshua where Joshua focused on what God had done for all the Israelites. As a way to encourage them going forward. And then we read what David says. And he focuses his son to think about God in the future. But what does he focus on in the past? He says, I want you to remember this guy was a bad guy. He needs to die. This guy was a bad guy and he needs to die. And this guy was a bad guy and he needs to die. And these guys were okay. You need to make sure that their treat did well. Now here's the funny thing. If you read the rest of the book of 1 Kings, you find that Solomon obeyed his father's instructions with the lessons about the past. Everyone that he says you need to make sure that they're taken care of and killed, Solomon makes sure they're taken care of and killed. What do we know about Solomon's life as he gets older, though? How does he focus on the Lord? Does he remember all the kind and wonderful things that God has done for the Israelite people in him and focus his life on serving God the way he wants them to? Or does he just kind of blow that off and whatever? We know the answer. The answer is that for a few years he appears to serve the Lord. He listened to what his dad said. Sure, I'll focus on God for a little while. And then he serves himself. He focuses on himself. And he turns his back on God to the point that he actually puts up idols in the temple that he built to God. I find myself wondering, this is Scott wondering, as he reads this passage and knows about Solomon, could things have been a little different if only his dad had said, hey, let's talk about what God has done for us and what God has done to us. Instead of focusing on what this guy did to me and what that guy did to me and what this guy did to me and what this guy did for me, maybe you should focus on how God supported him when he was pursued by Absalom and how God answered his prayers and spared the Israelite people and how God made him king and how God did this and God did that instead of what Barzillai and Joab and everybody else did. I know it's speculation on my part. I always put the disclaimer, speculation. But would things have been a little different if he had talked about what God did instead of focusing on what man did? We're sitting here talking about this year and talking about what the government has done to us. The government has done this to small businesses. The government has done this to people's freedoms. The government has done this. The government has done that. Maybe we should talk about what God has done. God has allowed every one of us here to live to see today. God has allowed every one of us here the freedom to continue to worship him. God has allowed every one of us here the opportunity to use this to talk about God and what he's done for us. And I'm just as guilty of it as anybody else complaining about the government. I love to complain about the government, even though we're, we're told to submit to them. I, I submit to them and then complain about them. But what if we focused our hearts, our minds, and our attention on thinking about what God has done for us, even in the midst of all this darkness, instead of being like David and focusing on what people had done to him? When he was the king of Israel. I mean, he's the king of Israel at this point, and he's... He's about to die in his own palace. And he's looking back and going, these guys are terrible. You need to make sure they're dead, Solomon. As Christians, maybe we ought to think about what God has done for us. As we look back on 2020, I want us to look back and say, what has God done for us? And what does that allow me to do next year? What has God done for me my entire life leading up to this point? And what will that allow me to do for the rest of my life? Much more like Joshua at the end of Joshua than David at the end of his reign. I mean, there's other examples we could look at. You could look at Jesus' prayers and speeches that he gives, oh, for about four chapters there towards the end of the book of John. He's talking to his apostles. He's praying to God. And he's talking about all these things. And then towards the end of it, 
I think it's chapter 17, he goes into a big long prayer to God. He says, God, I remember this, and I remember this, and I remember this, and I remember all these ways you blessed me. And now I just ask for you to continue blessing my followers going forward. He's recognizing what God has done, God has allowed him to do, and he's asking for blessings going forward after this major transition that's about to happen. And then I think about Paul. And the last thing that Paul writes is the book of 2 Timothy. And in the book of 2 Timothy, Paul reminds Timothy of a lot of stuff. I'm not going to go over the entire book of 2 Timothy. I know you're disappointed. The book of 2 Timothy, he reminds Timothy of a lot of stuff. A lot of blessings that God has given him. A lot of things that God has done for all of them. And he closes out with charges. He says, because of all this, Timothy, you go do the right thing. You preach the word. You be God's man. And if you get a chance, come see me before I die. Because I don't have long. And as he writes that, I'm sure Timothy read that letter and he gets to the last chapter and he's like, okay, so that changes everything, right? That he probably rereads the letter and says, this is the last thing he's trying to tell me. It's focus on serving God. And as Christians, whatever our situation, we need to look at it as how has God blessed us? Because what does James 1 say? Talked about this in your uh, Bible classes and sermons a little while ago. What does James 1 say? Our challenges are really ways to help us grow. When we have trials, we consider it pure joy because it builds us up as Christians. So when we look back on a year like 2020, where the people say it's the worst year ever. Well, one, you lack historical perspective if you think that. But two, even if it was the worst year ever, it's an opportunity to grow. It's an opportunity to become a better, stronger person and a better, stronger Christian and a better, stronger parent, spouse, servant of the Lord. It's an opportunity. And then next year is an even bigger opportunity because you're still here. Because what did Paul say? He said, hey, to live is Christ and to die is gain. Whether he's at home with Christ or whether he's here in the body, he's going to find the blessing in it. Right? And we should too. But you can only do that if you're a Christian. You can only do that if you are part of God's people. If you're not one of God's people, if you've not chosen to become a follower of Christ, you've not been buried with him in baptism for the remission of your sins because you said, I believe in him, I acknowledge him. I want to change my life to serve him. If you haven't done those things and said, you know what? So I'm going to be buried with him in the waters of baptism so I can rise and walk in newness of life. You need to. And if you've done those things, you need to make sure that you are still with him. Because you can walk away. We just talked about Solomon. Solomon walked away. Solomon walked away, and to our knowledge, he never came back. His dad walked away, but his dad came back. There's a difference. You can either never join Christ, you can never follow God, or you can join him and then you can walk away, never looking back, or you can join him, you can walk away, realize your mistake, and come back to him. It's up to you. If you need to join to Christ through the waters of baptism, we can help you with that. Lift up the trap door, get you wet. If you need to come back to Christ because you were joined with him and you wandered away, you regret that, you acknowledge the mistakes that you've made and you want to let everyone know, we can help with that too. If there's anything we can help you with today, Please come forward while we stand and say.